think we're uh, we're live. All right, hello and welcome to the MSA First Book Award panel. My name is Steph Krabs and I'm a professor of English literature at Ghent University in Belgium. I'm also an outgoing member of the executive committee of the MSA. I will be chairing this panel, which revolves around the association's one and only book award, generously co-sponsored by the Sage Journal Memory Studies. In fact, the panel is devoted pretty much entirely to the winning entry. Indeed, one of the ways in which the MSA honours the winner is by reserving a slot at its annual conference for a plenary panel that shines a spotlight on their book. In this session, you'll find out why the jury found the book in question so outstanding. Our co-sponsor will say a few words, you'll get to meet the winner, and you'll hear from three distinguished scholars who have graciously accepted our invitation to act as a respondent. They will share their unique perspectives on the book with us. You'll also have a chance to um, ask questions of the panelists themselves or yourselves. Um, on the conference website, you can uh, use either the chat or the Q&A tab uh, next to the live stream window to post your questions. If you are on Facebook or on YouTube, simply comment on the video that you are watching. All these channels are being monitored by a technical moderator, uh, MSA assistant Angus Foster, who will pass your questions on to me. And I will read them out to the panel members towards the end of the session. Speaking of which, rest assured that we will not be going on for two and a half hours as an earlier version of the program I seem to suggest that was a mistake. Uh, we're not going to do that to you. Uh, that, um, our aim is for this session not to exceed 90 minutes, which is typically the point at which Zoom fatigue sets in. Um, we might extend that by up to 15 minutes if the audience questions were to just keep coming, uh, but not by, by more than that. Let me say a few words about the MSA First Book Award. The award honours the best first monograph within the field of memory studies by an MSA member published in English in uh, 2019 or 2020. As little aside, since the language issue came up in the members meeting yesterday, I thought I'd mention that the MSA is committed to trying to make the book award more inclusive in this regard and others. The new executive committee will attempt to figure out a way to admit books written in other languages than English in the future. Just to be clear, that's something that the old executive committee was open to as well. But when trying to translate that principle into practice, we ran into issues of feasibility and quality and fairness of assessment. And that's why we reluctantly stuck to English as lingua franca in the end. Anyway, the jury was made up of Sarah Gensberger, Catherine Gilbert, Klaus Neumann and Jay Winter and chaired by me. I'm enormously grateful to Sarah, Catherine, Klaus and Jay for their exemplary service. I was impressed by the seriousness and professionalism with which they each approached this task. It has been a genuine pleasure working with them. We received nearly 20 submissions from which the jury drew up a shortlist of six titles, which was announced in April. You can see them on this slide listed in alphabetical order by the author's names. I'd like to remind everyone that discounts of 30% on average are available to MSA members on all of these fine books. To take advantage of these discounts, log in to the MSA website and then go to Members Area Resources Discounted Publications. At the top of that web page, you'll find instructions on how to order the shortlisted books at the discounted price. After further reading and deliberation, the jury unanimously decided that the award should go to Dominique Mengshuang Yang's book, The Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Memory and Identity in Modern Taiwan, which was published by Cambridge University Press. This is what the jury had to say about the winning entry. 
Dominic Meng Shuan Yang's The Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Memory and Identity in Modern Taiwan is a highly accomplished and extensively researched study of the history, memories and identities of Wai Shengren, the mainland Chinese who fled or were evacuated to Taiwan in the late 1940s and early 1950s and their descendants. Drawing on personal testimonies and documentary sources and engaging a broad range of memory study scholarship, the author thoughtfully and skillfully explores how these people who once arrived as invaders and refugees came to regard Taiwan as their home. Along the way, he provides novel perspectives on categories such as diaspora and trauma and introduces the generative concept of multidirectional empathic unsettlements. Carefully constructed, and written with narrative flair, The Great Exodus from China is an important and compelling read, both as an account of Taiwanese post-war history and memory politics, and as an understated story of the author's own intellectual and emotional journey. The jury would also like to recognize Anna Verprinska's Empathy in Contemporary Poetry After Crisis, which was published by Paul Grave Macmillan with an honorable mention. Well, we felt that these two books stood out. The field of candidates was very strong overall, and we want to thank each and every one of them for participating in this competition. Under normal circumstances, I would now officially hand out uh, the award certificate to the winner. However, that's not possible today for obvious reasons. And that's why we sent Dominic the um, official print copy of the document that you see on the slide via snail mail about a month ago. And I was pleased to hear that he received it um, just uh, yesterday or the day before uh, yesterday. So talk about uh, perfect timing, right? I want to take this opportunity to, to congratulate Dominic on behalf of the MSA on uh, winning the coveted prize um, for his excellent book. The travel grant that we were planning to offer the winner of the award to facilitate their physical attendance of the Warsaw Conference has had to be converted into um, a fee waiver for participation in this online only conference. In addition, we have sent Dominic a letter from our co-sponsor Sage with instructions on how to redeem a book voucher worth 200 uh, British pounds. Stop sharing my screen. Um, and speaking of Sage, I would like to now give the floor to Stephen Brown, um, who will say a few words in his capacity as a co-editor of the Sage Journal Memory Studies. He's also a professor of health and organizational psychology at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. And we're very pleased to have him with us um, as we greatly value the partnership between the MSA and Memory Studies, of which uh, this co-sponsorship arrangement is but one example. So Stephen, over to you. Thanks very much, Steph. Um, first of all, congratulations, Dominic, uh, for the incredible achievement. I mean, the shortlist looked phenomenal. So to come top of that shortlist, you know, and I, I know myself from having participated on the jury in a previous iteration as to well, just how difficult the, those decisions are. So yeah, it's a fantastic achievement and congratulations uh, from all of us at the journal and from our publisher, Sage. Um, I think uh, it's particularly important for us to be involved in this award because emerging scholars are really kind of central to the field and they're certainly central to our journal. When you look at the difference between our most cited articles and our most read articles, as one might expect, some of the most cited are by more established scholars and you know, articles that have been around for a while, but the most read almost inevitably are, are, are headed up by emerging scholars and by, by people really doing incredibly interesting, creative things. And, and the emer and emerging scholars really in the voice of that is incredibly important to us at the journal. Um, we're very proud more generally, I think, of our association. Steph just spoke of the, the longstanding relationship between uh, Memory Studies Association and the journal. And we're, we're super proud and always excited by that relationship and, and long may it continue. Um, I've been in and around the journal since 2008 when it was, when it was launched. Uh, and I think many of us can remember perhaps back in that time, there was already a sense then 
that memory studies was whatever we called it back then was a very energetic, a very lively and quiet, uncontained, perhaps unconstrained field. And certainly some of the aspects of that, in particularly the interdisciplinary aspects, I've always found the most fascinating aspects of, of, of this space. But there's always a danger with interdisciplinarity that you can kind of have conversations that go past one another. And, and really what's been wonderful to see with, with the, the birth and development of, of MSA really is a forum where all of those debates can come together and a real sense of an emerging identity across the field or of emerging sets of identities across the field. And that's, I think, been one of the, one of the many incredible achievements of MSA to, to, to pull all of that together. Obviously, the membership of MSA is, is core to our readership, and it's also core to uh, the authors who we're delighted to choose to publish with us. Um, uh, and again, uh, we hope to see many of the, um, many of the incredible pieces of work that have gone on over this conference. We will be absolutely delighted to see, see as many of those as possible coming to the journal. Uh, our shift now to being wholly online in the journal, so we don't have, like many other journals, we don't yet, we don't have now a print version, has actually been very useful because that means we can publish a lot more of this great work in each of the issues and we're not kind of constrained by print runs anymore. And obviously the issues that we have curated by MSA members are also very important to us. But we recognize that a great deal of the work that goes on at MSA doesn't just happen in those curated issues. It happens all across all of the things that, that we do at the journal. There's a slight sort of downside, and I'm sure any when you've heard talk from any journal editor over the past two or three years, there are challenges uh, to do with open access, to do with a shift to a completely different business model of how journal publishing works. And it is a bit of a challenging time, I think, to be a journal editor. And I think there's going to be lots of interesting developments in the kind of coming years around how, how journals work and so on. But at the moment, I think it's a very exciting time, obviously, both in this field and continuously for us. I'm always just amazed as an editor, just what phenomenal work we get in. And, you know, we would just want to keep publishing it as, as, as much of this work as possible over in the coming years. So, Dominic, congratulations again. Phenomenal achievement. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. And I'd like to just add that Memory Studies has expressed interest in publishing reviews of both the winning book and um, the honorable mention for which we're very grateful. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Dominic Mengshuan Yang to you. Uh, Dominic is a historian of modern China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Chinese migration. Born and raised in Taiwan, he moved to Canada with his family as a teenager. He holds a PhD from the University of British Columbia. He's currently an associate professor of East Asian history at the University of Missouri, Columbia. In fact, this is news hot off the press. Um, he has just been granted tenure, so even more congratulations um, are in order. As you've gathered by now, Dominic is the author of a truly remarkable new book, which uh, we'll have a lot more to say about in the rest of this uh, session. Incidentally, it's not just the MSA First Book Award jury and Dominic's Tenure and Promotion Committee uh, that think The Great Exodus from China is an outstanding book. Uh, it has recently also been chosen as one of the finalists of the International Book Award, sponsored by the American Book Fest in the category of general history. Clearly, Dominic is on the roll. On a personal note, I, I want to add that it has been a joy uh, working together with him on this panel over the last couple of months. And it gives me a great pleasure to invite Dominic to address us now. Okay, thank you very much, Steph, for that um, very, very kind introduction. Um, and I do have some slides I wanna show you, but before I start my slides, I just wanna say, how special it is for me to be here. The, uh, the honor, the privilege, and also the sense of humbleness because I've been a new member of the MSA. Um, you know, I've only started participating in the 
NSA, you know, MSA conferences since uh, 2019. Um, and what a treat that was. I learned so much. And, you know, even this year, you know, I want to basically, you know, you know, participate in, you know, in as many of the panels that I can participate and I continue to learn a lot uh, and find inspiration in in work done by you know uh, interdisciplinary fields of scholars associated with memory studies and um, and I would sort of mention some of them uh, in my presentation and a, a very sort of special you know shout out to Steph Kratz. Uh, post-colonial witnessing because I found that book when I was, you know, thinking about some of the issues I with the history that I deal with. And and Steph's book is definitely one of the books that provides me with, you know, forward thinking and this sort of outside of box look at with a lot of the issues that I've I've had a lot of trouble about, especially when it comes to trauma theory. So a special shout out to you, Steph, uh, for, and I've, n I've n never met Steph personally. I don't know him personally. I don't have any kind of intellectual connection with Steph. Before the book, but before I've written my book and before I, I received this book award, I just want to sort of make that clear. All right. so. Let me start by, and, and also, you know, obviously, you know, my thanks goes to, uh, I, I shouldn't forget this, um, the, the panelists um, uh, who are here with me today, and, uh, and also to um, the, the juries of the, of the book, um, uh, of the book of war, and obviously to Stephen and the Memory Studies uh, uh, Sage Publishing for sponsoring this award. Okay, I'm going to start my um, screen sharing um, now, so you should be able to see. And I understand that I have about ten minutes. So I'll try to stick to that time frame. Uh, what I'm trying to do today, because I only have ten minutes, um, is to basically sort of take you through <clears throat> three parts. Uh, the first part is the obviously or the origins of the book and. The second part is my personal background and how to relate it to um, the Chinese Civil War and the Civil War that produced that great exodus and the traumatic memories of these uh, people that were displaced from China to Taiwan after 1949, my personal relationship with that. And also, you know, finally, if I have enough time, I'll talk about the book Theoretical in Interventions uh, in Trauma Memory Studies, in which I, I sort of hope to raise three points here um, to sort of discuss uh, with, um, you know, people here the, with the panelists and also with the audience. Now, the origins of the book, and I put, put it here that, you know, uh, you know, I was, you know, quite alone for a long time. Not, like I said, I said this with an understanding that of my privileged position as, uh, you know, you know, son of a, a successful Taiwanese immigrant in Canada, how privileged that position is and to be, be able to accept it into grad school and work in academia and all of that is privilege. I, I am not discounting that. I said alone is intellectually um, because, you know, when I was in grad school, the advice, you know, for me is that, you know, you don't want to do this history that you are interested in doing because it has to do with post-1949 Taiwanese history. And for people in the China's field or in the East Asian field, because we're grouped by periods, right? So you look at, let's say, Chinese history through periods. You have the pre-modern history, you have the early modern history, then you have the Republican history, which is and then you have the uh, the PRC, the current regime. So for the uh, post-1949, that's sort of dominated by uh, people want to know about the PRC, about the current China, but not this other China. I mean, there are specific 
areas in which you can go into, but you have to be a political scientist or, you know, anthropologists of certain kind that are interested in local religions and folks like, you know, there are these, these niche fields, uh, you know, when you want to do history, when you want to engage in study relating to Taiwan, but overall, uh, if you look at my job position, like, you know, <laughs> contemporary China after 1949, there are really no position for the kind of historical research you want to do, right? So I, 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 I sort of took a leap of faith. <laughs> you know, I, I, I have to say that I wasn't a really good graduate student. <laughs> I admit that back in the days because I, I don't listen to my supervisors, and that includes when I was writing this manuscript. Um, the idea is that I should get a manuscript out as soon as possible. I mean, the story itself, because no one is doing it, that's originally enough, right? But it's, you know, why would you go into reading all these work about trauma memories and go engage in this larger sort of field of memory studies, right? So that was also the advice that I got because it's very important because I, I, back then I didn't have this job at University of Missouri, so I was on a job market, right? And I, 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 I'm not saying those advice were wrong. Those are actually really good advice. Uh, from my from my former mentors, who are all excellent scholars in their own right, who have years and years of experience and have my interest in 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 you know really steeply in their mind, right? They're they're doing this, they're giving this advice for my own good, but I sort of went my own way, and 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 it really has to do with my the reason why I'm so passionate about this project is really has to do with my personal background and my sort of engagement with this trauma. So in order for, you know, to understand that, I, and, and, and that sort of comes from, you know, this sort of my research trip back to Taiwan, uh, you know, and, and I took the East trip between 2005, 2011. The thing is that at the same time, I also went to China a lot. I went to, I think the countries that are the most, you know, love the most in Japan. <laughs> and I was looking for, you know, you know, subjects that will really interest me that, you know, what that it's worth investing so much of my time to do this <clears throat> PhD research, right? And I, I still, you know, I left Taiwan when I was 13 years old, and I really don't have an understanding of all the politics and other stuff that's happening. I know it's a democracy. Uh, I know that's where my parents were born. Um, I had a little bit of the 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 nationalist education that the tail, you know, because when the time that I left Taiwan was Taiwan was going through this process of democratization. Um, but I think the one thing that really struck me with this. When I when I became a graduate student and returned in 2005 was this accidental discovery of the re, my repressed family trauma, and it is then that was not the trauma of the, uh, um, you know how should I put it, of the subjects that I study, but my own family, which was actually on the opposite side of that. Um, they are, you know, and 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 I, I'm gonna. You know, in the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ethnic makeup of Taiwan, so you have a clear understanding of that the picture of different populations on Taiwan, right? Um, and I have to say that being a member, the reason why I, I I was so persistent in trying to basically do this project is that being a member of Taiwanese diaspora living in Vancouver, or I wasn't really the second generation because I wasn't born in Canada. I wasn't born in the United States. I, I went there when I was a teenager. So I was called a 1.5 generation. And there's just a lot of sense of this displacement. And like I said, this is not to say that, you know, people of Asian descent born in Canada and the United States won't have that displacement, right? It's just different kinds of displacement. And I really feel strangely attract, attracted to lived experience of displacement, and that and this history is related to Taiwan, right? And also because I am, and this is the point, I am essentially writing about the trauma of the people, the, the this group of one million people that were displaced from China to Taiwan at the end of the Chinese Civil War, or as people in my field want to call the Chinese Revolution, right? Um, 
my family was on the receiving end of that. The, it, it's the displacement of these people that actually displaced the local population because they came in as, of course, refugees from the Chinese civil war and political exiles. But they are at the same time rulers, this new ruler to this Taiwanese local population. So it's a very, um, you know, you know, to, to talk about the trauma of these people, right? There, there's got to be historical interpretation, interpretive issues and ethical issues involved, and also my subject position of, so I got interested in them, but this is an extremely, extremely hard book to write. I've thought about different ways of representing this trauma, of telling the story, and inside I'm struggling, like these are colonizers. <laughs> they, they put my family in jail, they shot my grand uncle, and I'm writing about how, <clears throat> about their trauma, about their being victims, right? So there is this really, really huge inner struggle that I went through. And it was actually a very positive process in the end because as, as you see, and, and, I, and, I, and I talk about all of this at, at, at the end, only at the end of the book, not at the very beginning. Um, it's it's kind of a writing strategy, like we can sort of go through. So anyway, I, I know there's not a lot of time, so I'm gonna go through really, really quickly um, as to, so there are basically, so Taiwan was a colony of Japan. <laughs> Um, you know, from 1895, 1945, it was returned to nationalist China following the dismantling of the Japanese colonial empire after World War II. And so 1945, we have three uh, different distinct groups on Taiwan. The native Taiwanese, my I don't like the, you know, my family, I don't like the term native Taiwanese because the, 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 the true natives of Taiwan are the indigenous people, right? The, you know, the second group, which were basically colonized and displaced and, you know, assimilated, you know, by uh, uh, Hakka or Hoklo Chinese migrants from southern Guangdong province, southern Fujian and northern Guangdong province. And so they're the ones who were, you know, when the nationalists came in, there was this um, uh, uprising of the local Taiwanese against them. And there was this huge massacre perpetrated by the nationalists and my senior relatives, you know, died. Several of them died during the uh, the massacre. And it is something that I didn't know growing up in Taiwan. You know, all that 13 years, I was kept in the dark. You know, I have to read in a book, an oral history book about this when I was doing research and that the, the amount of shock and the amount of anger, I, I went through a period where I just, you know, and the thing is, you know, then I started to realize that there's this more complexity to the Taiwanese history. And for my group of people who are the dominant population in Taiwan, we had been, we had been ruthless colonizer also to the indigenous people there as well. Then the mainlanders came in as, um, co as colonizers, but at the same time as traumatized, displaced, this traumatized, displaced population from China. So, so how do you tell that story, right? And this, th th this is the thing. Um, and so anyway, um, so the book at a glance, um, it's, you know, in a nutshell, it's a history of mainlander trauma and social memory productions, um, tracing the, the changing trauma of displacement experienced by mainlanders, um, the Chinese civil war migrants and uh, exiles in Taiwan and their Taiwan born descendants. So I go from 1940 to the, uh, to the 2000s and, you know, towards the very end, it was the second generation. They're actually interviewing their grandparents or parent generation and telling these stories, right? There's very specific instrumentality that comes from telling these stories when Taiwan democratized. And it's, it was only after democratization, these stories can come out because before that was like, what you're talking about under the nationalist dictatorship, you, if you're talking about that, you're talking about defeat. Uh, it's the uh, defeat is no good. We're going back to China tomorrow and beat the communists there. So uh, mainlander social memory productions in response to different collective social traumas in different historical times from the moment they've left China in the mid 20th century to their disappointing homecomings. And I said there are two homecomings uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. One uh, in China where they've left in 49, but they returned in the late 80s and early 1990s, found that post Mao China was such an alien place. Like they've been in Taiwan dreaming about going home for decades. They have all these projects of nostalgia, writings of nostalgia. Then the shock 
of actually going home. And I would say that trauma is sometimes even, it was even more traumatic than the initial exodus. Right? And they then came back to Taiwan thinking, okay, maybe now Taiwan is our home. And then that was the time when Taiwan democratized, when the local majority population that was suppressed took over. And they said that you mainlanders now are the colonizers who come over with Chiang Kai-shek, go back to China. So again, it is really through the understanding, like I said, before I start uh, my research, right? I have a very different goal. My goal is to basically expose everything that's bad about the mainlanders, really. 10 years ago, when I started this journey, uh, I started this research officially in, in 2018. But, you know, when I graduated from UBC 2012, and I start, you know, searching for a job, start writing this book, right? In the end, I have a lot of empathy for, and, you know, that really starts to get me thinking. So I, I, I won't go through the book chapters because I know probably I have two minutes left or, or one, uh, but we can definitely come back to this. I want to sort of end with um, the discussion of the theoretical interventions, because one of the things that I, you know, found, you know, doing this work when I I did the research first, and then I was thinking about, you know, ways to connect the story to a larger audience. I was looking into, of course, theories of diaspora, theory of trauma, and theory of memory, and I found it to be extremely troublesome in the sense that there, there are there are people telling me that, oh, you know, the people you talked about, uh, they're not traumatized because they can remember, and they remember all these things that you talk about. That means they're not traumatized, and I was like, where does that notion come from, right? And and so, and there's also this idea of that, you know, trauma narrative is bad, at least to like ethnic conflicts. And I know that's big in memory studies. And that's a position that I really agree with. But the thing is that if you sort of, you know, see the research that I did, you know, for the mainlanders and see that, of course, they are producing different memories at different times to make themselves feel better because their their condition of displacement actually change over time, right? The, the perceive of home, like what is home then? When can we go home? Then if we cannot go home, what kind of what kind of home and nostalgia we we can come up with, right? The, those change over time and that they they develop me different memories, but memory itself is therapeutic in, in their sense. And this is why it is so hard, you know, to, to, to say that instrumentality, if you show people this instrumentality, they'll be saying, okay, I, I'm going to not remember all these things because it doesn't really work that way. So for me, I want to end with the, the fact that, you know, this entire writing experience, um, other than the fact that I developed this idea of, of, of understanding traumatic memory as this long-term trajectory of evolution instead of, of historical trajectory, instead of a single event or event-based um, that is sort of, you know, commonly understand because that came out of the Holocaust and, and, and psychoanalysis and, 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 and the older generation of memory studies uh, scholarship, right? Other than that, the other, you know, you know, aspect that I want to talk about before I leave is the multi-directional emphatic and settlements and broad across in critical history, because that's something that I, and of course I'm taking, you know, ideas, you know, from Dominic LaCapra and Michael Rosper of mixing them together, because that's how I feel. At the end, you know, my anger and my, you know, there was being a, a receiver of my parents' trauma or previous generations' trauma. And, and by studying the other side's trauma, I was able to sort of mediate that. But mediate that in a sense that, you know, I understand where that comes from. And I understand why it is so difficult, you know, for the mainlander not to understand Taiwanese trauma, but instead, you know, encase themselves in their own trauma, right? And 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 I see that it's, you know. You, you have you need to develop empathy, but develop empathy in a multi-directional way that you you know so so for the communities to, to start conversation with one another. Um, I think I've gone gone on long enough, so I'm just gonna stop there, stop sharing, and this is what I want to talk about. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Dominic, for uh, this 
very fine uh, presentation uh, about your book in which you elaborated on some of the uh, most intriguing and, and, and fascinating aspects of it, I thought. Uh, the next three speakers, if you like Dominic, are all based in the US, are experts in the fields covered by his book. Uh, we're very grateful to all of them for agreeing to shine a light on it uh, today, each from a different angle. Collectively, I believe they will give you a multifaceted and um, comprehensive sense of the book that we are celebrating. First up is Carol Gluck, the uh, George Sanson Professor of History at Columbia University. She specializes in modern Japan, international relations, the Second World War, and history writing and public memory in Asia and the West. In fact, I remember hearing her talk about her important work on the comfort women, the sex slaves of the wartime Japanese military at an earlier MSA conference. We're very honored to have her with us again uh, today. By the way, I, I hope that she and the other speakers will forgive me for keeping my introductions so brutally short and uh, skipping so many of uh, their wonderful achievements. That's all in the interest of time. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Carol. You're muted, Carol. I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. I've lost my screens. I can't see you. I can't see my comment. I couldn't see my mute. I am working. I, I am working without power right now. So I, I do apologize. Um, I, I would like to um, congratulate Dominic and echo what's been said. This is a wonderful book. Uh, it tells a story and it makes an argument and it weaves oral history and historical documents and fiction and film and personal passion into what I thought was a gripping analytic narrative of the changing memories of these mainland Chinese migrants to Taiwan across generations and more than half a century. And along the way, he counters the dominant historiography of 1949 as a singular epical event. He criticizes the uniform characterization of all 1 million migrants as nationalist party affiliated elites and he disputes received narratives of nationalist leadership on Taiwan, which is saying a lot. Uh, and he does a lot. He says these things in an engaging empirical and interpretive fabric that I read almost as a novelistic narrative in which the mainlander Taiwanese become the main but never the only characters in a panorama of Taiwanese history and politics and society from 1949 to today. But I think the book does even more. And so what I'd like to talk about is, is the relationship of the book to the study of memory and to our conference this week. I think this book shows not only how collective memories are created, but how they change and under what circumstances and with what, and this to take the theme of the conference, with what convergences or conjunctures of factors impelling that change. So I regard this as a model study of the ever ongoing process of memory formation and alteration, not only in Taiwan, but almost anywhere. So I'm gonna mention just five of, I think, many possible examples of what I mean by a model study of the processes, the ever ongoing processes of memory formation and change. First, memories are born, are not born, but they're made, and they're made over time. And they're not made as their protagonist please either. And as you know, the, man, the mainland Chinese arrived in Taiwan, their immediate memories were of war-torn China, layered afterward with the hope that they were just so, sojourning in Taiwan and could return to China. And then when that hope was disappointed by political realities, their memories focused on a cultural nostalgia for their lost native place. That identity was then shattered by Dominic's two homecomings, the realities of a China that was no longer a homeland when they finally visited it, 
four decades later, and then battered again by the altered realities of a newly democratic Taiwan, where they were denounced uh, as colonial interlopers at the very moment they were rooting themselves in a Taiwanese rather than a mainland identity. And these are what Dominic presents as the social traumas. So the book shows how the mainland narrative, the story that eventually made the exodus the founding moment of a refugee, that is to say victim identity, did not emerge until the 1990s. And that's more than 40 years after their exile or forced migration had begun. And number two, in terms of this process, the protagonists or agents of memory do not create their story by themselves. So politics in China, politics in Taiwan, geopolitics, the Cold War, the anti-communist DNA of the nationalists, US-China relations, the distinctive situation of Taiwan, which as you know, is not recognized as a sovereign nation or a member of the UN, the question of its dependence or the Chinese insistence on its return to the motherland, all interacted to determine the zigzags of memory of mainland Chinese over this time. So in a word, context matters. And Dominic does a fantastic job of showing this. And generations matter too. And the book shows how the next generation, Taiwan born, not mainland born, never actually bought into the native place nostalgia of their parents. And yet they were pioneers of the Exodus narrative that became the main story of mainland Taiwanese identity in the 1990s. So convergence and conjuncture are needed to explain how these stories are formed and how they change. Number three, similarly, but slightly differently, one group's story entails another. And Dominic attends to the impact of the mainland migrants on the Taiwanese, both the Taiwanese originally from South China, Japanized by 50 years of colonial rule, and also the indigenous peoples of the island, marginalized by all. So who else is affected by one group's narratives? Who are the victims of this case of the elites turned victims? This matters very much in the study of memory. And the book does a great job of questioning the term diaspora as it applies to the mainland uh, uh, Chinese in Taiwan, though Dominic says they were of course diasporic, but from the Taiwanese point of view, as you've just heard, they were also the usurpers, the occupiers and the colonial rulers of someone else's land. And when Taiwanese could say so openly after the fall of the nationalist dictatorship, after democratization, in the 1990s, this is, that's what they called them, foreign colonial rulers. But then again, this happened at the very moment that the mainland Chinese of several generations were rooting themselves in a Taiwanese identity, transforming themselves in the story from dominant elite minority to victim minority. Now, this is an incredible story, and it's not only in Taiwan, where a, where a minority rules a majority, where there are injustices of colonial rule. You, there are so many examples. Rwanda comes to mind, but so do many others. And as an aside, I have to say that I wondered why Dominic avoided discussing the decades of nationalist dominance uh, as colonialism, since it shared all those characteristics, including a civilizational arrogance. But I thought at the end, when he explained his own Taiwanese heritage, and as you just heard, that his research actually changed his view of the mainland Chinese. And that maybe for that reason, he did not want to join the chorus of denunciation of them uh, as colonialists. And I think this is a tribute to his sympathetic imagination. I think the empathetic um, understanding that he's talking about multi-directional applies to him as, as well and makes this book, it informs this book with this uh, sympathetic imagination. Number four, single events are only the beginning of the story. As you've heard, Dominic argues against both the psychoanalytic and the sociological perspectives of the importance of a single traumatic event, in this case, 1949, and he shows how memory concatenates in response to changing context, times, and generations. Single events become multiple as mainlander 
attitudes changed as subsequent single events affect them. So memory as process, not product. Do you think of 1948 for the Israelis, the founding of their nation for Palestinians, the, the Nakba, the catastrophe, an ongoing past in the present. Or 1947, another event, partition for Indians and Pakistanis and for Muslims in both countries, another past in the present. And many others, the, the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, the German expellees also forced migrants from the East after World War II. Each of these and many others were associated or impelled by single events, but their narratives actually turned on the convergences and uh, conjunctures that happened after it. Um, just a minute now, I've lost everything now. Um, can you hear me? Because I can't. Yes, we can. I, you can. Okay, good, because I just it just dropped out. Um, so I think in this in this case that Dominic is showing that that this is a story without an end. And I think that's really important, especially now that we are thinking about what might happen to the Exodus narrative as things continue to change. And I should imagine we're all thinking of the future of Taiwan as we contemplate the present of Hong Kong. So that I think is a model of the, the processes, the theoretical interventions into the processes of memory. And so no matter what our interests are in this memory or that, or in a different context, one or another, or with different purposes, as we've seen this past week, we've all learned a lot, but this book challenges us, I think, to approach our work with greater complexity, greater conceptual cap capaciousness, and I would add greater historical compassion. It's a model, and Dominic, I thank you for it, and I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for those uh, wonderful and, and, and very thoughtful comments. And I'm glad you made it through your response, despite uh, those power issues. Um, OK, um, by the way, Dominic, I'm going to give you a chance to respond um, to the, um, you know, the, the, the responses. But let's first uh, go to the other two um, speakers that we've got lined up for, um, for, for today, right? So next up is Rebecca Nidostop, who is an associate professor of history and East Asian Studies at Brown University. She's currently writing a book on a topic that's closely related to that of Dominic's book. Uh, it deals with the making and unmaking of community among people displaced by conflict across China and Taiwan from the 1930s through the 1950s. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and Do um, Dominic, congratulations on your award and congratulations on um, having your book so beautifully characterized by, um, by Professor Gluck. Um, that is an award in itself, I, I think. It is, we should all be so lucky um, to have, um, to have um, such an honor um, and justice done to a magnificent book. Um, congratulations. Um, I want to also congratulate you on um, conceiving of a book that I think in addition to everything that Carol has laid out, it really has the potential to reset the terms on which we understand um, the 20th century history of Taiwan and its relationship to China overall. Um, and uh, to do so in some of the ways that you've described, but um, I, I, I think that you've helped us, helped us move forward several steps along those ways. Um, and the way I read the book um, is on a couple of levels. And one is on the level of the discussion of um, traumatic experience, social memory and identity formation as you laid out and as um, Professor Gluck uh, um, expanded upon. But um, I also saw it as at its root um, containing several interlocking narratives and lessons about power. And those are, those are the ones that I want to um, concentrate my comments on. Um, the first lesson is um, one that you've already hinted at a bit. That's a salutary lesson about the damages of um, Cold War history as um, traditionally and bilaterally conceived and sort of the damages specifically that that history has done to the field of 
modern Chinese history and, and, the, and how Taiwan fits into that history. Um, but I think that we can expand that further and think about why has there been this, why has no one done this work that you have had to do um, in all these years? Um, why is there been this absence of this story from world history? And why has, um, has there been this, um, why don't we think of, um, why do we uh, think of, um, even if we think of, of 1949 as a precipitating event, and I agree that it should not be, it's one of a series of precipitating events and continuing pasts in the present. Um, but we tend to think of it in, um, in um, strictly sort of political terms rather than sort of social terms or sociological terms. And I, I see, so I see this book as fitting into a important series of, of new scholarly works that reconceive um, the role of, of um, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia um, as in the reshaping of Cold War history. So I'm thinking of um, um, Honik Kwan's um, uh, The Other Cold War, um, and, um, but also um, Yenla Espiritu and the scholars that make up the field of critical refugee studies from coming, mostly coming out of Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian American studies as revealing um, that there is a hot Cold War um, history in the everyday, um, in everyday lives. Um, and that that belies these kind of bilateral frameworks of the kind of traditional Cold War history. And I think it's long past time that our, that 20th century histories of China and Taiwan join them and your work is, is a, the sort of the, going to be a sort of seminal step forward in that light. Um, and that you also, I think, help a broader readership do that through your, um, your crisp theorization of memory work and your framework um, there. Um, I think you also provide us with a second lesson about how um, social memory shaped by traumatic experience is directly translated into social and political power. Um, so I think this is a book that I would ask anyone who is working in the field of Chinese and Taiwanese studies to read, regardless of discipline and regardless of time frame. Um, because of things that you allude to in the um, in your um, in your introduction, but also because um, you sort of dissect the underpinnings of truisms about modern Taiwanese society, the Republic of China, and the history of the field itself, which people tend to scholars, I think, encounter in their everyday work, in their socialization. Um, which have sort of floated, free floated in our world without much critical examination. Um, and um, so, you know, for one, you know, to take one example, you're able to write with sympathy and a clear analytical framework about this, um, what sojourning mentality um, does to people, this common social phenomena and how it creates, um, it translates into these, common cultural tropes where, you know, people are um, sort of treating, um, you know, writing about Guizhou dialect and cuisine and treating their Taipei surroundings or Taiwan surroundings in a similar way, but that translates into very real and damaging social and political attitudes and effects. Um, and that is something that in conversation, in social conversation, people are very familiar with this kind of free floating attitude. And, but it's very rarely been put into print and analyzed the way that you have done. So that is um, extraordinarily important. Um, and um, because it translates into this history of nationalist power in Taiwan um, and the construction of nationalist power in Taiwan. Um, and so you then sort of use it to kind of skillfully um, dissect um, and compare the cultural capital of mainlander memory work in the 1950s versus say the memory work of someone like Long Yintai um, in more recent years. 
And um, even just the, what you write about Long Ying Tai, I think is extremely valuable um, because of her influence and continued influence and, and how she was at first warmly welcomed in, in China and then became unacceptable. Um, and then I think you, you do something really important, which is you gently and politely suggest that this resulting power structure and then a sort of a, um, an attempt to refute it by turning away towards China actually shaped the field of Chinese studies and how scholars from the outside um, approached, you know, learned, got material, approached the field. Um, and I know that you are, you have been involved in your own collective research projects about scholars who, who, who um, did research in, in Taiwan um, and how that helped underpin the field. Um, so um, that is, um, I think, as we come to understand how the, um, this um, movement of people is also a, um, a construction of the terms of knowledge um, and um, the terms of, of knowledge production um, much more broadly, it is, this is a first important step to us re-examining the field overall. So this is a book that I would, you know, I'm gonna assign widely and I, I urge all my, um, my colleagues to read. And then finally, um, I thought, I, it, the thought of um, the work of the scholars in critical refugee studies, um, as well as, as scholars in, um, in literature and, um, which is a field I will leave to the expertise of Professor Chen to talk about, um, came to mind when you were talking about um, at the end about, about your own sort of experience and intergenerational trauma, um, and which I also was, was struck, really struck by, moved by, um, appreciated how you put that on the page and then how it was reflected in the work, um, this, this sense of, um, of being um, forthright about it, but then also this, the empathy that, that translated on the page. Um, so I, you know, in a way that I think it, it really takes um, scholars of your subject position to be able to grapple um, uh, in a sort of comprehensive way with the nationalist period. And so I, I see you as part of one of this really exciting new generation of scholars of Taiwanese background who are writing a new and more, much more comprehensive history of the Republic of China, um, whether it's the Republic of China and Taiwan or the Republic of China um, before 19, 1949 um, in, this really, in these really fresh ways. And you're doing it because this is a way of grappling with the power, the extension of power, and a way of rewriting this narrative of dealing with the colonial power, even if you don't state it as such. Um, and so, um, so I really, I really appreciate that. Um, if so, I'm, I'm curious as as just a couple of a question, if I would, I would raise. You know, if there are narratives as, you know, one of the, the problems always when you're writing a book and making that transition from dissertation to book is what you have to leave out and, you know, to create this, this cohesive narrative. So if there were narratives that you wanted to, in, to include that you were, um, weren't able to, things that you want to explore more in future. Um, and, Thinking about um, comparisons, you know, I, I also agree that you, um, the way that you handled the literature on diaspora to me was, what I found that very satisfying. Um, it's been, it's a very, um, um, it's a very copious literature now, and there've been a lot of different takes on it, and I quite appreciated it. But I wondered how you thought that the story that you were telling, um, if it fits in with some of the more recent work on um, on um, Asian um, Asian American or Asian Canadian, say settler colonialism, 
um, class differentiation in migration. Um, does that liter do you think that literature has any relevance to the Taiwan situation or not? And I ask that mainly as an open question. I've been um, grappling with that together with graduate students. So I'm curious to hear your take. Um, but thank you so much for this, this wonderful book. Um, and congratulations again. Thank you, Rebecca, for those uh, very generous and, and insightful uh, comments. Um, before we go to the third and final respondent, I'd just like to remind uh, the audience that if, uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to post them either on the conference website, you know, the, the chat or Q&A tab or uh, on YouTube or face, Facebook, whichever platform you're using, and we'll put them to the, uh, the panelists towards the end of the session. Last but not least, we are joined by Letty Chen, a professor of modern Chinese literature at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research, her research centers on identity politics, memory, migration and displacement in modern and contemporary Chinese language literature from China, Taiwan and Hong Kong, as well as in works by the Chinese diaspora in the West. So again, a clear affinity with the subject of Dominic's book. However, as a literary scholar, Professor Chen has a different disciplinary background than Dominic, Carol and Rebecca, who are all historians. I'm curious to hear her take on the great exodus from China. So Letty, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just realized I'm the only uh, non-historian here. Um, so it's an it's a advantage. Um, let me, uh, first of, of all, uh, of course, I want to congratulate uh, Dominic, uh, this wonderful achievement. Um, when I uh, f first discovered his book, I was thinking to myself, oh man, he wrote my third book. <laughs> now I have to change the topic. <laughs> what am I gonna do now? <laughs> so, uh, so, but then that shows that, you know, this uh, book really is a very comprehensive, um, very in-depth and, and to me, um, very touching. Uh, I myself am also uh, a Taiwanese. Uh, I have lived in the United States uh, much longer than I have lived in Taiwan. Um, so this question about uh, the 1940, the legacy of 1949 um, means a lot, not only to the Western and the Chinese mainlanders, but to the Taiwanese as well. Um, uh, you know, just like Dominic, I actually had the whole complete set of nationalistic education uh, before I came to the United States for graduate school and took me a very long time to get rid of that kind of, uh, 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 you know, brainwashing, <laughs> that kind of influence. Um, so when uh, that is what I wanted to, to begin a new research project, also focusing on this um, this historical moment and go from there. Um, but as a as a literature uh, as a literary scholar, of course, my uh, my primary materials tend to focus tend to you know uh, focus more on uh, narrative constructions, you know, narrative analysis, uh, interpretation of of uh, uh, written words. Um, but that does not mean that you know historical. Uh, uh, documents, archival materials are not important and they are very important to literature as well. And this is what I have been seeing in the recent trend, how uh, uh, literature and history, uh, historical studies and literary studies tend to come closer and closer, more, than, more so than before. And this kind of goes back to this very old Chinese um, uh, a saying, it says, when shi bu fen jia, right? When liter literature and shi history, you cannot separate the two. Um, and, and that is a phenomenon that I've been seeing uh, quite uh, a bit recently. Um, so Dominic's book to me uh, is very si significant in uh, a, a couple of ways, specifically uh, in the ways in which Dominic frames his study of the exodus, uh, of the Chinese exodus, um, you know, how he treats this historical event as a multi-generational event and, and consequently a multi-generational memory of trauma. And to me, this reminds me very, uh, uh, you know, uh, vividly in my, the, the, sec the, the book that I just published last year on uh, how the Holocaust 
is to the Jewish people a multi generational traumatic experience and memory, and that uh, you know says quite a bit to me. Um, and and because with um, I know Dominic does not uh, 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 you know dwell in his book. He does not dwell on this uh, the Holocaust as the signifier and so on, but it is in the backdrop. And my uh, question uh, immediately that comes to my, my mind, the question immediately comes to my mind is, how would that necessarily affect our interpretive frame if we have, um, uh, you know, the, the, this kind of this uh, signifier, signified or sign of, of this Holocaust, since we're talking about traumatic trauma, uh, uh, you know, life altering generation, multi-generational altering events, a memory, uh, how would that affect our interpretive frame? But then how do we then justify? That's what I uh, uh, grapple with in my own, own book. Um, but so, so I still think that, um, you know, uh, it is important to, uh, at least for uh, literary scholars, you know, interpretation is the key. So in just establishing a, a, a clear interpretive frame, uh, to the Chinese Exodus uh, narrative, it will be uh, significant to me. Um, and another thing that I uh, also am very interested in, in is um, how we can break barriers that have hindered our understanding of the profound human cost, you know, the human cost of the displacement of the Chinese mainlanders and the suffering of the Taiwanese people in the hands of the, the KMT government, uh, you know, post-1949. Uh, so, um, so these are uh, things that attract me. Uh, and the, um, you know, the, the, the primary materials that uh, Dominic has, uh, you know, used in his book is, uh, is you know, the, across many, many genre, uh, genres. And I thought that was tremendously uh, interesting and important. Uh, because, you know, stories are important, you know, testimonies are important, as well as archival materials are important. They are equally important because they take different, they tell different stories. They tell different uh, stories from different angles and with different, uh, uh, what we call narrative strategies, right? Um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, Professor Clark and, uh, you know, Rebecca have already said quite a bit on the, uh, wonderful accomplishments of Dominic's work. So maybe I can talk a little bit about how his work uh, has um, inspired my own current ongoing project. Um, right now I'm focusing on uh, the, the uh, anti-communist literature, uh, Fan Gong Wenxue of the 1950s and 60s. And, um, and I thought this is, uh, uh, you know, a Dominic's book, lays a very solid foundation for me so I don't have to do all that work and then I can just build on his work and move on to what to the things that I really want to do. Um, so the uh, so my argument with the Fan Gong is is to challenge this label and I, I think it's important to call it diasporic literature because it does this body of uh, literature uh, in the 50 produced in the 50 and 60s by Ren only. There's almost very few, uh, maybe one or two uh, Taiwanese authors, but they are overwhelmingly all uh, Mainlander, Chinese Mainlander or, uh, authors. So, uh, and then of course this label was imposed upon uh, by the, the KMT government, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the, the geopolitics of the Cold War. And then the, but, but, but then the problem with this label, label is that it is, not only uh, misleading, but it also obstructs our understanding of the, the, the real human suffering, the displacements, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, trauma and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so, so my argument is to get rid of this label and call it a diasporic literature, Li San Wen Xue, because the writers are all displaced Chinese managers who, you know, who were diasporas at the time re re uh, residing. Uh, in Taiwan. But what I think another important uh, contribution that Dominic's book has made is um, creating this uh, connectivity, you know, of, of generations. And this can be, you know, of course, this kind of generational connectivity is quite evident in uh, across the, 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 the field of Holocaust studies. 
Um, and so, uh, so this thing about if if I you know continue to take uh, the Fan Gong Wen Xue or or now I would like to call it Li San Wen Xue, and then as a first generation Chinese Mandarins, they're writing of their. Uh, you know their uh, war experiences, their, their their displacement experiences. Then that's linked to the second generation of Chinese mainlanders, what we now call has traditionally called the Zhuan Chun Wen Xue, right? Military compound literature. In fact, is the post memory, the post memory of the second generation Chinese mainlanders who inherit their parents' first generation uh, uh, memory and then becomes. The, the, the source of their cultural, they imagine nostalgia for China and so on and so forth. So this kind of generational, multi-generational connectivity uh, in literary study is important. So then you get to establish a new understanding of how literature, uh, you know, Taiwanese literature uh, as a historical narrative, you know, as a historical, uh, the, the historical trajectory uh, of Taiwan, Taiwan uh, literature from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and so on and so forth. So that to me um, um, is most inspiring uh, of uh, uh, Dominic's uh, uh, work, um, you know, and so the, um, <clears throat> So but by not treating uh, this kind of, uh, you know, 49 as a, you know, this exodus as a single event, which is absolutely, uh, 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 you know, brilliant, um, you know, so the, uh, so then we can then, if we are able to establish a, a construct a new uh, historical tra trajectory uh, prior to 49 and continuing on to 49 and how you can, then bring the Waisheng Ren and the Taiwan Ren together as a group, because we all struggle together on the island under the authoritarian government led by Chiang Kai-shek. And so, so uh, the, 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 the challenge is not so much as to separate these as two groups, and then of course the Aborigines as a third group, but to look at them all together as a one big group. We suffer differently and we, we have different uh, uh, victimhood narrative to tell. And we also have, uh, you know, uh, em empathy for each other. Cause after all, we, we, we all live on this island, you know, uh, for all these so many decades already. Um, uh, and then how do we then link that to, to the, the, the concurrent, the Mao era, you know, the, the two parallel uh, historical trajectories that were happening, they were in, in, impacting each other. So how do we do that? That's actually why I am thinking about writing a third book after I've done my second, I want to do something similar with Taiwan <laughs> with my next book project is to just look at using this uh, perpetrate, you know, the question of confession, the question of te giving testimony, the ethics of testimony. You know, th there's a lot of ethic going up, you know, it, it's, it's it, uh, for someone to come forward to bear witness to a historical trauma has comes with a heavy ethical responsibility. Okay, so so this kind of uh, victimhood is, you know, there's no innocent, well, I shouldn't say that, but victimhood is not simply just victimhood. Okay, there's much more complexity in it. So we talk about uh, guilt, talk about confession, talk about giving testimonies, uh, talk about perpetrators and victims, victimhood, or the victim and perpetrator all at the same time. Um, just like you know, Dominic said that you know, in uh, at the end of his project, how his mindset has changed. Um, you know, my I I, I came from uh, I come from a, a Chinese family uh, on my father's side, at least that I know. Uh, during the February twenty eighth incident, uh, many of our his really his uncles and cousins. They were they disappeared. Um, we still till this day we still don't know what happened to them. I mean, we all have a this kind of uh, horrible, painful pay, past. But then, is it enough just to look at that as a painful past that we are victims? I I don't think it is that simple. Um, so perhaps I can still uh, you know write my third book along with with along my uh, you know original idea, but. But I really want to thank Dominic for this book coming out, you know, so timely, at least for me. 
Um, and uh, we we are very close well in Missouri. Uh, so, you know, very soon I would like to invite you to watch you and we can, um, you know, have a in-person session <laughs> instead of, uh, you know, virtually. Yeah, thank you. Isn't that nice? Thank you so much, uh, Letty, for those uh, great, really interesting comments. And I'd like to invite uh, Dominic uh, to respond to anything you've just heard. Well, thank you very much, Steph. And uh, wow, how can one respond to, you know, all of the things that I just said? I mean, it's it's pretty much my first book of war. So uh, there is actually no training to tell me how to really respond to because, you know, usually when you we're, we're intellectuals, when we write, you know, you know, to comment on each other's work. Um, and most of the time anonymously is usually saying bad things, right? <laughs> and to have all these good things hurled at you. And sometimes one is just um, a little bit overwhelmed. I think the over, you know, it's, the, the thing is, you know, I, so I'll basically try my best uh, to respond to the things that I think that sort of struck a chord with me at this moment. When I come to look at my book again, you know, now it's been a while since I've written it, you know, I've been able to look at it with a critical lens uh, myself as well. And, you know, first of all, you know, to, uh, uh, Professor Gluck, um, I have to say to get this kind of commentary from you, it's it's really something special again. It's that it's a wow thing again. And uh, you basically simply capture a lot of the stuff that I try to sort of do in the book and you summarize my book better than I ever can do it. Um, and the thing is, um, there's a point I want to basically raise, which is about um, the the empathy that I have for the mainlanders and also the, you know, why that in the book, I just don't want to come out and say it. This is, you know, a, a form of colonialism, a form of whether it's settler colonialism or, or another form, you know, it, it is a, a, a sort of a question that I, you know, you know, it's that I grapple with, right? How do you, and this is related to also to Professor Chan's, you know, comment about interpretive framework, right? Of course, Rebecca also talks about that as well, but in, in the sense of a larger, um, you know, Chinese historiography and knowledge production. But then let's come back to this um, because of, of course you can say that, you know, the fact that they're forced to leave home and they're kind of political exile doesn't mean that they're not settler colonizer. Look at the 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 first group of Americans who came in Mayflowers. I mean, they're Protestants. They're being persecuted, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean that they're not rapacious colonizers to, to the Native Americans here, right? They destroy local culture and just do whatever they wanted and just you know have their this you know self justification based on religion, civilizing mission, whatnot. Yeah, definitely. On um, and there's a lot of, so, you know, now come to think of it, right? I think I agree with you that, you know, it might be in the end that, and also, you know, other than empathy, because I do really develop a lot of empathy, but I have to say inform empathy, because I think one of the main point of the book is that about traumatic narrative and memory that I'm trying to make is that, you know, when you look at traumatic, you know, when, 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 we, the, the post-memory generation, you know, if you put it in Marion Hirsch's word, right, the term, like when we sort of try to engage with, you know, the trauma that's actually experienced by former generations, we, we, we have a relationship with, we try to sort of deal with it, get beyond it, and it, it's extremely emotional, right, it really affects us emotionally, but sometimes that emotion can come in a way of this kind of, a, a sort of a strong jolt and gut reaction and in the end you leave with something a feeling of I don't know like you know when, when one's like traumatized you know as a secondary witness you're kind of like you, you leave with okay now what okay so they're you know mainlander displacement displace and sort of uh, murder what some of my relatives and then but you know oh, what we do they're also they also have a sad story so what does that leave us right <laughs> how, how would I deal with that situation and the historian or I tried to try, write a narrative about 
it, right? To tell this story to a larger audience, you know, in a way that is justified, that's ethical, that's balanced. How would I do it? Right? It's, you know, this is sometimes when I'm writing this book, I'm going crazy. Like, you know, do I make them out as good guys or bad guys? Right. And 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 I think it's, you know, it's with all these inner struggles, right? This is what I come up with, you know, a kind of suggesting that if you look at it, right, that this, this the sinocentrism of looking down the loco, say like it, but it is something that is a little bit different. This is what I want to point out historically, because we're talking about historical specificity here. Um, when Japanese colonizer come into Taiwan or Europe or even European colonizer come into East Asia. Like this is just for me, the, in the sense that there, there is this difference that's already set up, right? In terms of European colonizers and the the, the Asian locals or, or African local others, the racial distinction is there. Like you just separated by race. You are a privileged class just by the virtue of your race. Uh, in Japanese colonials, this is much more complicated because then the colonizers and the colonizers are the same race, right? But the idea is still for Japanese to make a distinction that we are Japanese. And this is why Stefan Tanaka wrote a re really good book about <laughs> Jap Japan's Orientalism, right? Distancing itself from the rest of Asia. We're a kind of a very special group of Asian people. But I would say that, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, Chinese settler colonialism is not colonialism, or mainlander colonialism that's happened in post-1949, the 45 Taiwan is not colonial, but it is definitely something very different. There is this presumption that you are one of us, even the even the indigenous populations are intrinsically, at least in this narrative of Chinese nationalism, part of the Chinese nation. It's just assumed. But you are different. We can see that difference, right? You still speak Japanese and you're you're kind of the hateless, right? We're kind of so how do we deal with that difference? And and this is what I see in a lot of mainlanders. They, you know, first of all, they don't really you know, they look down the Taiwanese, they rule the Taiwanese, they try to synthesize the time when you said having this civilizing mission very similar but in the end I, i'm trying to say that there is this presumption that you are one of us you are just a lesser version of us in which we can transform you to become us and there will be an end to this colonial situation or, or they don't call it a colonial situation they call it i don't know relocation the central government of taiwan <laughs> i think that's the and I find that fascinating, and I don't know how to deal with that. I think there's a, I, maybe I need to write another book, another scholar need to write a book, another book to, to deal with that. So this is, you know, like I said, empathy and this difficulty with topology, colonial pathology and interpretive framework is in the end, I made the decision, a very conscious decision, as you pointed out. So brilliantly that, you know, that's how I frame it, right? And, and, and just to, like, like, I know, like, I have, I have sometimes a problem rambling on a little bit. Um, and to 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 Rebecca, um, you know, knowledge production and power, those are, you know, those points are really, really well taken. And like you said, I, you know, sort of hope that this book, especially with the historiographical part um, that I that I do, um, will basically enable a lot of the you know the people that are in the China field or in the Taiwan field to you know really think about their assumptions like how the entire discipline developed like the way in which you know even now like I'm working with several scholars in the PRC who do Taiwan study to their version of Taiwan studies and it is through that experience that I realized wow why nobody here ever wants to do Taiwan studies or or, or they do Taiwan study but they go to Taiwan right because if you go to mainland China if you write anything about Taiwan under this the Xi Jinping it was it was already a little bit sensitive before the previous more liberal time under Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping, but now under Xi Jinping, because I have a, a PRC scholar, historian who I work with, and she said my last book about Taiwan, you know, it was under review for like two years. Then my publisher tell tell me that you know because she she made revision so many times, have to really hand it over to above to the parties, a different level of censorship, right? And then come back, you need to change all these things. And the thing is, like after three years, the publisher said, well, the book is already outdated. Maybe it's best we don't publish it, right? <laughs> and she was. 
she she had the same view as me. Like what you know, when it comes to the topic that I talk about in the mainland, and she's like, I wrote the report to the party high ranking people in Beijing, and she was reprimanded. She was said, it was like, come on, this is so against the party line, the party interpretation of the Chinese Civil War, all that sort of stuff. Um, so definitely, and and when when foreign scholars, Western scholars travel to China, of course, you know China is important in itself, and it's a it's a field that's you know a study about PRC is a lot larger. It's it will never Taiwan studies will never replace that. But the the thing is, like you know, there is a reason why because you know to do research in China, you need to find some local collaboration. Your local collaborator will not willingly get into Taiwan studies because that's a very sensitive area, and that translates into knowledge production in our university, where you don't have a lot of Taiwan studies. And the the sad thing is that even Taiwan is now a democracy; the the archive is open, and you know, there are there are still a large number of people like in our field who will not go to Taiwan to do Taiwan. Well, I mean, excluding the panelists. <laughs> that's just why I invited them, right? But you know. And I don't know why. Anyway, um, Letty Chan, um, you know, Letty, Professor Chan, I mean, you know, what can I say? I mean, we will have a lot to really talk about, you know, between us about, you know, the, the you know, the, the, the kind of thing that you said, uh, especially so, so I'm in, in the interest of time, like I can respond to so many points. I'm going to just respond to the, your point on the anti-communist literature in the 1950s. These are literature written by, um, you know, as you said, predominantly mainland Chinese scholars, and they are, you know, as of now being class, being sort of classify, characterize as mainly government propaganda because the money comes from the exile government for, for them to produce this. Uh, and there was a lot, of course, there was a lot of exaggeration or how many people that Mao's regime, you know, killed in China. And when we're in the resistance war, when we encountered with the communists, how they, what the things are doing to the peasants, they cheated the peasants out of it, land reform, oh, that's all a lie. Um, there's a lot of hyperbolic things, but when I was reading all this stuff, because like I said, there are literally like thousands of works that's been written during this period of time. And people, you know, really, I, and when I was reading that, I was like, this is, this, these people were not forced by the government to produce it. Of course, you can always say that they're exiles, they need livelihood, and they come to rely on the government. This is one of the things that I talked about in my book, right? But when I see the stuff that they write about, although that's fiction in our mind, it has to come from, and this goes back to Professor Gluck's idea about this entire sort of social reality and context, right? It must come out of that context. Therefore, there are valuable historical sources for interpretation. And as you know, for a literary scholar, literary scholar history will be a very valuable sources to you know analyze interpretation and interpretive framework. So yeah, I, I think wonderful. I mean, I would love to see a, a book actually targeting the specific area and making the kind of argument you're making. Okay, I mean, I'm gonna stop. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, uh, Dominic. We've received like a handful of questions and comments from the audience, which um, we'll turn to in a minute. But first I'd like to give um, the the other panelists the chance to uh, react to you know anything Dominic has just said or each other's uh, responses for that matter but please do keep your um, your, your comments relatively short because we've got a couple of um, audience questions and I, I really hope that we can get to those um, as well uh, Rebecca over to you so uh, I just have one very brief comment that it occurred to me um, regarding the um, comparison about um, colonialism, settler colonialism, and knowledge production, um, memory, nostalgia. Um, one of the, um, I think, unfortunate things that is beginning to be rectified in the field of China and Taiwan studies overall is that um, Taiwan studies has developed, Taiwanese history has developed as a relatively independent field. And Chinese, um, uh, uh, the um, study of China's, what we can um, uh, use the um, infelicitous term border regions um, of, you know, sort of, of uh, Xinjiang, 
um, Northeast China, Mongolia, uh, Tibet, uh, Southwest China, et cetera, has developed um, in its, um, independently as well. But as you were talking, especially as you were characterizing the relationship of, of um, the um, sort of a construction of social nostalgia and power and its relationship to um, the nationalist government, there are, and I was thinking of some of the things um, that have been produced particularly by literary scholars um, about um, the, um, the cultural production of nostalgia uh, among people who were in the um, Bingtuan in, in Xinjiang, you know, people who, who migrated to Xinjiang, Han people who migrated to Xinjiang during the Cultural Revolution or um, sent down youth and of course, Letty knows well about this too, sent down youth um, during the Cultural Revolution. There are a lot of correspondences. Um, and um, so I think that you know, the next step in the, in the field that would be really useful would be for people who work on those areas of, um, to, do, to be in greater contact with, um, well, first to read your book, <laughs> and to then to be in greater contact with people in in Taiwan studies, so to help um, sort of dispel some of the ideas about what Taiwan studies are that you alluded to in your first slide about um, uh, that the utility. I mean, there's there are many many ways to geographically um, situate Taiwan in um, regional history in global history, um, but uh, but this can be just one of them. Let's go ahead. Yes, um, I just a, a couple of quick response responses. Uh, Dominic talking about uh, you know books being banned in China. Uh, I had a book contract with Fudan University Press for five years. Is a translation of my first book, which is about you know uh, pan Chinese uh, identity politics. And eventually, the um, it's been reviewed. I revised. They take out, delete this and that. And finally, the editor decided to uh, revoke the, the contract just because it is too quote unquote sensitive. I mean, it's just talk about, it's, it's ridiculous, okay? So I just kind of, okay, forget it. So, and then this <laughs> very quick response. The second is, um, you know, yes, the Fan Gong Wenxue, a lot of the intercommunist, uh, 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 you know, the so-called Fan Gong Wenxue, uh, uh, it's a lot of um, very, you know, overly sentimental, uh, you know, the, uh, melodramatic, hyperbolic kind of, but the, the thing is, at least for literature, literary scholars is for us to decode a lot of the messages, you know, what is underneath, what is lying underneath, how do you tease out a lot of the excessive, unnecessary, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, embellishments and, and narrative details. So what is really at, at the core, and if, if you read enough of them, if you read enough of, enough of this type of literature, this body of literature, you will get a common narrative, something that is underlying. It is a historical testimony. To me, that is reading, that is try to unearth, you know, this kind of um, uh, uh, testimony that is hidden, buried, and maybe it was unconsciously done by the authors. But we as a reader, so many years later, it is our job to, to unearth Kind of, I, I, in my book, I, I, I use, um, you know, uh, for course, you know, archaeology, you know, archaeology of knowledge, right? We should become archaeologists to, you know, to dig it out. And, and I also want to respond to what Rebecca just said about, you know, Taiwan, China study and Taiwan studies as two separate fields. But then the truth of the matter is there are so many similarities, parallels, just like what Rebecca just said. And then there is a, a, a connection there is an undeniable connection between China and Taiwan. I mean, you just cannot say these are two, you know, very unrelated, uh, 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 you know, societies uh, or nation state or what, what not. So, so then the question is then, then what can we do to unearth, to rebuild this connection? What can we do as scholars, as historians, as literary scholars, as, you know, uh, scholars of other fields, what can we do to, to, to make that connection, that intrinsic connection between China and Taiwan become visible. Um, 
for example, you know, uh, one thing that I have discovered in my study, in my research on the Fan Gong Wenxue writers is I actually, I actually uh, believe and convinced that these, uh, the, the so-called first generation Wanshan Ren in Taiwan, uh, they, they were uh, educated during the, the 20s, 30, 20s and 30s in China. They are the second generation Wu Si Wen Ren. You know, they are the, the main fourth uh, li li literary, uh, 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 they, they carry this kind of uh, second generation main fourth literary and cultural inspirations. So, so there you have that another connection, right? And so, so really, we really have to change our lens, you know, the, how, how we see, see these, uh, uh, you know, research topics and subject matters. And, and, you know, again, back to your book, it is what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, let's see. Let's uh, go to questions from the audience then. There's a question from none other than Anna Veprinska. Anna, so glad that you're, you're watching and congratulations uh, once again. Um, this is uh, what Anna has to say. Dominic, so many heartfelt congratulations to you on the award. I was struck by the perception you mentioned some, in, some individuals having. If you remember, you're not traumatized. Can you speak further to the origins of this belief? I'm interested in the ways such a belief pins memory and forgetting against one another in a space that doesn't allow for their coexistence, even though memory and forgetting often work hand in hand. Thank you, Anna, for that, <clears throat> for that question. And uh, also my congratulation to you for you know, uh, getting the uh, the honorable mention. I mean, given what we're go going up against, you know, it is a, a no small accomplishment in itself. And uh, I would definitely, you know, go find your book and to, to purchase a book and to read as well. And thank you for that wonderful question. Um, you know, for, for me, like, you know, probably, you know, I would say that a lot of people in this conference will be, you know, more equipped to answer that question, you know, compared to me. But from what I look at, I, I'm not going to tell you where, I'm, where where this is coming from, and I, I and I think it really comes from late 19th century, early 20th century, when you know psychoanalysis and and people are engaging in some sort of this question of you know what what is this memory thing uh and there was there was a time when there's a lot of interest in this memory right you know that the memory becomes a, a problem um and of course uh psych Freudian psychoanalysis has such a grip on the entire our entire reflection on on memory especially in traumatic memory so i guess you know this is where of course you know that's further developed by you know people down the road in the, in the 20th century like you're talking about entire genealogy uh from from foy um all the way to like kathy caruth in the 1990s so i you know i i believe all of you are really familiar with that and like i said that has such a great influence and so and, and you see, this is what, you know, being an outsider mean, right? You know, when I was trained in University of British Columbia, like, first of all, all my supervisors, they're all specialists of PRC history. So I am doing work that's outside of them. And, and they are, not a lot of them are really interested in, 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 in theory, well, except Tim Brooke, but he let my, my dissertation committee in the middle of it to go to Oxford, right? So, and then, but other supervisors really empirically minded. So I have to, so, so like I said, I have no reading of this entire literature or no contact with any of this. I'm just really concentrating on doing research, research until 2013 and 14 when I started to read really widely into this literature. I, I just read the important works that people told me to read like, yeah, you, you need to read Kathy Carruth, you need really need like, you know, uh, uh, Maurice Hofswag and, you know, starting with his mentor, the, the guy who started sociology and then you go Ray right down all the way, I guess, to, um, I don't know, Jeffrey Olick. I mean, I, and then, then you, you go to like, you know, Steph. Um, but yeah, but in all of this, like my experience reading, because when you are, you already came with an theoretical work, the entire story, the research that you did against all the theoretical presumptions, you'll be like, wait a minute, that really doesn't fit. 
right? I mean, like you said, I mean, you know, forgetting and remembering, you rightly point out that's part of the memory work. That's how trauma works. But I mean, you know, I, I guess I guess the biggest criticism about you know, psycho, this sort of psychoanalytical notion of trauma is that you take people's agency away, right? Just to say, okay, you're not trauma. First of all, you're saying that, okay, it's like, it's ludicrous to say to the, although these exiles of the civil war wouldn't say they were traumatized. I mean, that's not the language that they use, right? They wouldn't use trangshang, which is, but you can see with the the, the the kind of stuff they, they've written about this nostalgia this this place and and i also come to this realization that there is this difference between this sort of individualistic western type of and this is why memory loss is such a big thing and i i, I talk about it in the book right because the lose of memory the lose of individual faculty to recall one's history is such an infringement on a person's agency his ability to basically make him as a the ability to make that makes him as a person right but if you look at the civil war exiles of the mainland uh, I'm not arguing that there aren't there weren't people who are really traumatized because you know they in the sense of this Western understanding they, you know they there were people like this is a very uh, you know complicated community there were people People that are in the higher end, they just ride planes and ships to Taiwan, very comfortable. The displacement itself, the, the separation family is very traumatic for them, but not the actual, they didn't see the war. But for, I guess, the 50% that comes at the very end when the nationals reaching class, oh, they've seen their family and friend being separated and being killed and blown to pieces on the way. You know, they're on the boat, people dropping into the sea. I mean, all kinds of tragedy. I mean, that was traumatic in a sense of, of, of Western understanding, right? But the thing is, um, people try to fall back on their memory, right? Um, the anti-communist literature that we talked about, a lot of that for me is a side of memory. People wrote, wrote, people write stuff in it and create a world in which that make it easier for them to accept their conditions their, than their existence on Taiwan, right? And I said, if you look at the anti-communist literature, a refugee experience in China, you know, during the Japanese invasion really, really looms large. It was just there. And if they can't talk about the this displacement so they talk about that and that in itself is an expression of, of trauma and the and also a way in which they want to basically repair that trauma right and that for me it's the job of historians and individual researchers to understand that context to to understand that people really sort of try to you know adjust to their situation in their own way, given the kind of historical context and cultural repertoires that is actually at their disposal. And that is given um, the subject itself, historic agency, agency historically, right? And this is why I'm sort of against, um, you know, this sort of event, of course, you know, memory studies that comes out of sociological tradition, I'm more in agreement with that. And this is why I'm here participating in the association. But again, like there's another set of problems that I talked about. But anyway, um, but but this thing about, you know, you know, you have to be, you know, it, we, we have to help you remember. Like if you can't remember, we're gonna have the historians will do it for you, or the, the psychoanalyst is gonna do it, or international aid workers is gonna come in after a huge natural disaster to tell you how you should mourn, right? Without consideration of local customs and tradition, how they bury the dead and all that kind of stuff. That is ridiculous, right? This is, you know, this is, I think, how, how you know, scholars, you know, should do their work. And this is, you know, from history, this is what I'm trying to do with this book. Anyway, um. let me let me stop you there, uh, Dominic, if you don't mind, because we've got uh, several more questions and only like, you know, five minutes uh, <laughs> left. You know, what I, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to read out uh, or, or group together uh, these questions and I'm just going to um, sort of dump yeah. them all on you and you okay. just uh, pick and choose. Uh, what you'd like to respond and I, to. And I'll, um, be, I'll be quick and brief with my response. I'm, I'll, I'll try to do that. 
Excellent. Um, there's a question from Ai Chung. I was wondering how the third generation could um, or was able to cooperation and revisit the ancestors' memories with their own more natural national identity, self-identification as pure Taiwanese rather than part of China. How does generational memory interact with each other in these three generational differences? Um, there's a question from Yen Yu Lin. Dominic, thanks for this wonderful book. So glad uh, to listen to this in-depth discussion on modern Taiwan at uh, the MSA. I wonder if you could speak to the current great exodus from Hong Kong to Taiwan, to the UK and to elsewhere due to unfortunate political realities in Hong Kong. How would you view your work as theoretically instructive for studying diaspora-based Chineseness and political refugees in other Sinophone cultures as well? Um, and Finally, there's a couple more comments, but I'm going to stick to the questions. Um, a question or two questions actually from uh, Lin Shang Zhang. Uh, Dear Professor Yang, thank you so much for the wonderful book. Thank you for all the inspiring comments from the professors. I'm wondering if you differentiate diaspora from displacement because diaspora is such a loaded term. This is also related to my second question. Are you struggling with the ultimate dilemma in area studies? That is Western theories and their application to East Asia. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, wonderful questions. You know, for the uh, the first question, the third generation, right? Um, you know, they are, you know, a little bit removed from, you know, so when we're talking about third generation mainlanders, we're ta generally talking about people who were born in the late 1880s, 1990s, like after Taiwan's democratization, of course. Um, they uh, do have, you know, some of them, you know, when they're, a little bit older. I mean, a lot of them just uh, accompany their senior relative to go to China, right? But I would argue that they, you know, some of that, I, I talked a little bit about third generation. That's a certain part of the book. I only, I gave only two examples. I don't know if that's enough. But if you look at, you know, the kind of, you know, and there's really very little on this statistically, right? But, you know, the statistic that we have on the third generation, because a lot of people after democratization didn't identify to, if you ask them or like, you know, if did your grandfather came from China, they will decline to answer that. This has to do with the stigmatization that's attached to the mainlander identity, right? But my understanding is that they, they're they even more Taiwanese, you know, I mean, invested in this Taiwanese identity, an identity that's separated from China uh, compared to their, their, their parents and grandparents. So, you know, how did, like, would they go willingly go visit um, the the old family ancestral graves in China, I would doubt it very much. But there there's always going to be a minority of, of people who, because we're talking about different individual situations, right? Um, that will you know because of the family situation, because of the um, the stigma and discrimination that they receive that you know after Taiwan democratized, they thought they can find another you know cultural home in China in a sense, although they don't want to physically stay in China, they they hope that one day China and Taiwan can unify and then, you know, and they they sort of would go on these pilgrimage if I, you know, ancestral grave pilgrimage. Um, I'm, I, I don't deny there are uh, people like this, but there are a very small number of people among the third generation. I, I, I hope that answered your question. Um, and the as to, the question from Yanju, I think the is you know very interesting, and it sort of allows me to sort of go back to to answer uh, Rebecca's question. The second the question, you know, because you asked me about the you know one of the things you asked me is about the things that I were put in the book, right? Like, you know, I, I took out, because I took out a lot of stuff from this book, right? You know, because yeah, I, I you know, have this huge manuscript and the Cambridge University Press editor told, told me that we will not accept any manuscript that's over 120,000 words. So one of the chapters that I took out and it's, it's related to this Hong Kong question, I call it, there was a chapter called the second exodus. That exodus was to the United States. By you know from mainlanders and I, I and I also talked about the Taiwanese right so you know two 
population. They all went to the the the, the one the Taiwanese side will participate in overseas Taiwan independence movement. The mainlanders will have their own sort of politics uh, in the United States, and some of them even join like the leftist pro Mao group, and you know, and they got to return to China early, and that's a very interesting story, and that definitely sort of come into intersection with Asian American studies and the discussion of settler colonialism and all that complicity to either against um, the US hegemony during the war, Cold War or complicity with that, right? And 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 so back to the the, the Hong Kong question. And, and, and I would, you see, it is still going on right now. So I wouldn't make any predictions, right? I mean, one of the things about the privileged historians is to say that we study the past and we don't have comments <laughs> anything on the present. But the thing is, I would say that the dynamics of identity, loss, nostalgia, and to, to fall back on memory, you know, as something that's therapeutic, as something about, you know, you know, recognizing one's identity and a collective identity, all, all these sort of dynamics that you see in the mainlander story will come into play in the Hong Kong exodus story, this sort of Hong, Hong Kongese diaspora the, or the great exodus from Hong Kong that's in all parts of the world. It's like what Dr. Gluck has said earlier when she's commenting on my book, like this is not only a Taiwanese story, this this story, the, the, the kind of story that I talk about can apply to other culture, other situation. But the most important thing to, to always pay attention to is the transformation and historical specificity and cultural specificity that comes with it, right? And very, very quickly, the last um, question asked by Lin Shan, thank you for asking that question. Um, the, 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 the area of study and then, you know, the, the <laughs> Yes, I, I think we are all, in a sense, trying to engage uh, with, um, you know, Western social science. It is a way in which we can make a contribution, right? But I think the most important thing is just not to apply that, you know, for like I said, for me coming as an outsider and have you know, nothing to do with the, I, I didn't start my training, you know, just fill myself with all these theory, thinking that they are a tool for me to look at things. Like I go in the field and look at the things and, and, and read it and, and interpret it, understand it the best I can. Then I come back, you know, I and, and when I come back to to to, to read these theories, I, I read different schools, I you know, I, I read very broadly, right? And then of course there is this process of selection of what you want to engage with, what you want to not engage the debate. But I think the most important thing is to to, to basically, and, and, and if you see something wrong, that there is this disjuncture, that's an opportunity for you to, you know, to, to make an argument, to, to put a stamp, um, you know, on this, uh, on this debate saying that, you know, like coming from my case studies, this doesn't fit. And what doesn't fit, this is not in universal theory. Right, and universal theory becomes universal theory because it has been, you know, proven by, you know, all these case studies from all around the world and, you know, and it's not. Anyway, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Sorry, Steph. <laughs> That's okay. No, we're, we're hopelessly out of time, uh, Dominic, but it, it's, you know, okay. it, it's great to just listen to you. And I don't want to bring this session to a close without reading out um, uh, two comments uh, from members of the audience, which I found so touching. Um, there's one from Alexandra Vietz or Vietz, um, who writes, I cannot tell you how radical and refreshing it is to hear you tell the story of your personal struggle in grappling with and negotiating all the complexities of writing this book. It is inspiring and deeply moving. Thank you. And Ai Chung writes, thank you for a wonderful book as a third generation Taiwanese with ancestors from both mainlander and early Han Chinese, I am very moved by your interpretation and our own history of Taiwan that is still uh, going on. So I, I, you know, I thought these comments yeah. were too beautiful to, to skip. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I think the only thing that, that remains for me to do now is to, to thank all of our speakers uh, for sharing so generously of their time and insight. Um, I thought this session, this session uh, was hugely illuminating and, uh, and I'm sure many people watching feel the same way. So thank you also once again to, to my fellow jury members um, for all their hard work, to our technical moderator, 
uh, Angus Foster for his help making this session run smoothly and uh, to you the audience for your interest and um, active participation. In case you'd like to re-watch this uh, session, you can. The video recording will remain available on the conference website but also on Facebook and on YouTube. Don't forget that this is not quite the end of the conference yet. We're getting close, um, but there is one final plenary session left, which starts at 6.30 p.m. CEST, that is. So that leaves a good amount of time uh, to stretch your legs and maybe grab something to eat, whether for dinner, breakfast uh, or lunch. 